uh, Dodd-Frank thing, it's creating a consumer protection bureau, and so on and so forth. The Republican elites gave Republicans exactly what they wanted under the Obama administration, which was complete resistance. So if the elite, if the Democratic elites and the Republican elites for eight years delivered pretty much more or less what the rank and file wants, I'll just throw this out there. What the heck does that say about us that after eight years we're like, what's wrong with the system? Well, well the elites actually, in both parties. Yeah, I agree with you, Andrew, 100%. One of the things I was going to say is I am tired as a communication person, not as a political entity, um, a citizen, um, of hearing we only have shitty choices. And the reason why I'm tired of hearing that is because I don't actually believe that to be true. Um, I was 100% a, a Hillary fan. I was behind her from the beginning. No, I was never a Bernie fan. Why was I a Hillary fan? Well, the CHIP program. That sold me, and also for what she did in Arkansas, that allowed my son to get what he needed until I was able to adopt him when he was 10, 11 years old, okay? I have personal reasons and personal attachment to Hillary Clinton in that way, not Donald Trump, surprisingly enough. My experience with Donald Trump has been all business. Uh, being from the Northeast, you can't go anywhere without hearing that Donald Trump did something that day, okay? You guys have been hearing about him for two years. I've been hearing about him for 42. And the thing is, is that it's not one of those things where I felt like, oh, I have to choose between Democrat and Republican or terrible and terrible. I really wanted to do something better. The problem is, as, as we were just pointing out, as Andrew just pointed out, and as Bill just pointed out, is that nobody wants it to be better. We keep saying, well, the system is what the system is, the system is what bro what's broken, but we don't participate in the system. So, <coughs> excuse me, whose fault is that? If we say the system's broken, we're supposed to be the system, but we're not doing our job, then how is that the system's fault? But that, what, that's why the story worked so well for Donald Trump, and 46% of Americans did vote for Donald Trump, and they had reason to vote for Donald Trump, and we could knock it all we want. But the legitimacy of the presidency is extremely important, and we need to remember that as American citizens. You might think, oh, it's great to buck the system, and I'm going to play my Green Day and be anti-establishment, or whatever it is you kids do these days. But that was really easy. I'm sorry. That, Green Day was my day. It was my day. My day. Yeah. But I don't know who your equivalent is. Um, it's certainly not Taylor Swift. But I think that the bigger, the bigger question is, is it the system that's broken, or is it your role in the system that has been neglected? Um, and I say you as if it's your fault. It's my fault, okay? It's my generation's fault. We Gen Xers want to curl up with our cure tapes. There's another reference. Wear our black, God bless you, and curl up in our bedrooms and, and, and write bad poetry. But the fact is that at some point you have to face your responsibility. And we're at sort of a, I think we're at a turning point on whether citizens are gonna matter or not. And if citizens don't matter, we're in real trouble. The good news is the heat seems to be on and we seem to be popping again. And there are more social movements coming up every single day. Hashtag movements, Facebook movements, whatever you wanna call them. Um, and I will tell you that hashtags are not movements. We could talk about that another day. But that we are in fact, if Donald Trump did anything, he motivated people who love him and people who hate him. And that is a thing, that's a good thing. Uh, at this point, we've stayed real broad, we'll get more specific here very soon, but uh, if anybody has any questions that they'd just like to ask about this presidency or uh, uh, in general about our current political system, anything Dr. Dudash or anybody has said so far, by all means raise your hand, we'll incorporate you into the conversation. Just give us your name and whatever your question is. Otherwise, we'll just continue our conversation. Your name and what your issues. I know who you are, though. My name is Alexis Ash. Um, I'm not quite sure. A blue shirt and blue hair. I can't remember. Dr. Dudash. Blue hair would work, too. Okay, yeah. I won't forget now, obviously. But um, I, I wanted to know you mentioned something about the CHIP program. Can you kind of explain more about that? I don't know about that. That's the Child Health, Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, it is. 25 years old. It has been self-sustaining and extremely successful for 25 years. It's a healthcare program that uh, mends the gap, if I understand this correctly, between Medicaid, where Medicaid drops off, and where insurance would not pick up. Now, you probably don't remember this because I don't know how many of you are paying attention to insurance prior to 
um, the American, the Affordable Care Act, but um, way back when, uh, people like myself who were raised in steel towns and got weird lung diseases like sarcoidosis or popcorn lung, um, in my case it's sarcoid, um, we, we would not be allowed to get health insurance because it was considered a pre-existing condition. My diabetes is also considered a pre-existing condition. Um, even though we, could, we know what the causes were, when it happened, I was not on insurance at the time because I was in graduate school, it was before Obama, and we did not have any protection at all, no health care. When the ACA was passed, I had health care. So I'm one of those people that would die without it. That's, that, I'm that person. The CHIP program functioned the same way when, and by the way, that's no means for you to support it necessarily. It's okay if, you, if, if you're against it. Um, the CHIP program sort of did the same thing, but for children. So under the age of 18, whose parents did not qualify for Medicaid, which, which, which would give them coverage, um, and uh, would pick up where the insurance companies would drop off and where Medicaid would drop off. That program was created, invented, made by Hillary Clinton, who um, as I believe First Lady at, in Arkansas, First Lady in Arkansas, so this goes back a long way, started this program in Arkansas and made, helped uh, whip up the support to make it a federal program, and it has been incredibly successful since. Um, we, as we vote on the ACA and on, on uh, Medicare expansion and everything else, what we're doing is we're working around the CHIP program. The CHIP program is always there because it funds itself. It's pretty amazing. Um, and that program took care of my three stepchildren, well, two stepchildren, my son, and right now it's taking care of my two grandchildren. So I am incredibly supportive of that program. I think it's the one thing that spoke to Hillary Clinton's character before all this other crap came 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 down, and that's why I use it as the example. Thank you very much. Great question, Alexis. Anybody else got a question you'd like to ask? I mean, I'm pretty loud, so if you don't want to. Oh, uh, go ahead. We can hear you fine, Amelia. Okay. Um, I have a question for something that you said. Um, Me? Yes. Oh, I, I, Sorry. I, I probably can't remember. No. <laughs> um, you said something about the government not being in the business of making money. I understand that, you know, if you if you make the government into the business of making money, it's gonna change policies in the stance of, are we doing this for money or are we doing this for the people? Because we're based on, you know, the people's vote is what matters, you know? Um, but how can we be a government who doesn't, not in the business of making money, but still spend as much money as we do. Interesting that's question. A, that's a good question. That's a yeah. really interesting. And, and that's a that's a fair question. And um, and um, uh, again, um, one of my majors in, in college was was economics, and this won't mean anything to you, but uh, I was brought up by devoted Keynesians, so um, I, I know that uh, I know that. Uh, that's a deep cut. Uh, that is. That's why I'm thinking. All that means is that I'm okay with deficits. <laughs> But, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, no, I mean, sure. Perfect world, right? We have as much money going out as we have coming in, mm -hmm. right? And um, we, we've, we've, uh, we've never really had a balanced budget uh, in this country. Uh, we've had some times of budget surplus, mm -hmm. right? Most recently uh, at the end of the, the last Clinton administration and then, you know, a couple of uh, Iraq wars and, and some tax cuts and, and bailouts kind of, kind of put us into the, uh, tank on that. So uh, I guess my point was is is I don't know that you that if somebody says we need to run government like the business a business in the sense of you know let's look at let's look at our expenses you know and, and you know what what are we spending money wisely on um, let's look at our sources of income where do we get our income from do we get it on the backs of the middle class or the poor do we get it from the rich I think those are all legitimate decisions that. that, that um, you know, could 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 be asking, but but to say that because somebody is a successful um, chief executive officer of a corporation, um, and and that that is automatically somehow going to translate to being successful in government, I just don't think those things are true. And and again, we can argue back and forth about whether Donald Trump was a successful you know businessman. I mean, he's, he's obviously uh, a well-known businessman and, 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 
and so on and so forth. But again, if you're a chief executive officer of a corporation and you don't like what's going on, you fire your you fire your uh, you know your your, uh, your officer or close uh, down the business. Yeah, or, or, or close down the business. You know, you can't do those same things. You can't fire Congress. You can't. You, can't, you know, you, you have to work cooperatively. And so, so that's what I meant. Not that not that we can just spend money willy nilly. Uh, you know, and not worry about it, but that uh, we, we should, we should, we should be, you know, fiscally responsible and things of that nature. But, but we can't say that because you run General Motors successfully or you run Fast Pro successfully, that, that you're going to be able to automatically deal with all the very complicated things that this government has to offer. So that, that's what. I'm and do you have a thought? I, also, I think it's important to think about how uh, different government is from a business from the standpoint of. Well, one, government controls the spigot of cash, mm -hmm. basically turn on the printing presses. Not, now we can have debates over what that will do to inflation and things like that. But, uh, you know, from everything from the states on down, businesses and all of that, we have to work under a legal fiction that that business is not always going to be there. That at some point the account must come due. But, government is set up with the idea that it is considered to be ongoing and so a deficit in one year will turn into a surplus in another year but we never have to make the account balance one year from you know from one year to the next because there's this legal fiction that we you know that government will always be there and barring something horrible it most likely will be so um, I think ultimately when we talk about deficits and all of that we're looking at a completely different legal thing for the federal government than if we're talking about state governments, municipalities, or businesses. That's such a great question. Anybody else have a really good question? That's a really good one, Amelia. Thank you. Hi, Paul. My name's Whitney. This is for any of you guys. Um, so something that really appealed to me during his inaugural address was what he was talking about, um, like really focusing on like domestic policies and the problems that we have like internally, but it seems like and maybe it's just because these are problems that are going to be more long-term fixes. Um, so have you guys seen anything that maybe doesn't get like broad media coverage? Yeah. Um, it seems like a lot of this stuff has been, you know, having to do with like foreign affairs and stuff like that. So is there anything that you guys have seen that have kind of gone back to what was the promises he made during his inaugural address, inaugural address with like domestic problems? Um, I think, well, I'll jump in at, and, and Dr. Dudash, Dan, anybody else want to jump in, that's fine. Uh, one thing I've really seen him work hard on, uh, uh, or at least his administration work really hard on, is uh, illegal immigration, and immigration in general. Obviously, he's tried the travel bans. Travel bans have been blocked so far. But uh, illegal immigration, uh, it, it is creating a crisis in this country, uh, particularly for the undocumented immigrants themselves. They're the ones that suffer the most under our current immigration system. Now, one thing this presidency has done, it has uh, ramped up a, what Trump himself would call a deportation force. Um, how that deportation force is being used, the reports are mixed as to how humane they are. Uh, the reports are also mixed at how successful that can be. Um, obviously, Trump himself has not slowed down his rhetoric of a wall, which is important. He elected him in part on that promise. One, uh, for all of his actions on immigration, inaction and action, one thing it's definitely done is drive down the amount of illegal immigration we have seen in America since he's been elected. This is one of those, one thing that uh, Trump likes to pretend is that if you put him in office, things will magically improve. But illegal immigration is something we have directly, immediately seen a complete drop. Uh, we have seen from the first month he has been president, there has been a 40% drop in illegal immigrants coming to the country. And in addition to that, and I think I've mentioned this in class a time or two, but in addition to that, families that have immigrated to the United States have dropped 90%. So if you believe that illegal immigration is a problem, and I do, primarily for the immigrants themselves, turning off that spigot, or at least weakening as much as possible, I think is an incredibly important thing to do. I think that's something he has more or less delivered on. you have a backup question? Yeah, I think what, more what I meant was like, when it comes to like infrastructure and education and poverty, he made a lot of promises on that stuff, the war on, the war on drugs, so that was, his other, but you know, maybe it's just because right now, the immigration is really prevalent. 
So right now we're seeing a lot of uh, governing by proclamation, governing by executive order, and things like that. And there's only so much you can do, as Obama once said, with a, you know a pen. Um, and this is one of those areas because this is something where he's going to need the help of Congress. Now, that shouldn't necessarily be a problem considering his party is in control of Congress. But, uh, you know, they have had some executive orders that have gone out uh, encouraging the government to buy American, things like that. Although, if you look at the actual text of those orders, they're fairly legally toothless uh, because they're going to need Congress to get into the game. Um, and this has the last three Congress, I won't say three, Congresses have been historically um, inept yeah. at getting things passed. <coughs> so unless, unless the Congress will come in and actually pass some laws that he can sign, he may not be able to necessarily <coughs> get a lot of those promises passed. But we're looking at, you know, but we're looking at a Congress or several Congresses that have passed a third of the bills that they normally would. So they're just not writing law. And whether or not we have too many laws or not, but if you know you want by America, that's something that I think a lot of us would say, great. But we need Congress to step up, write a law so that the president can sign it. And I think what's particularly troubling to me, I guess, um, is the whole health insurance. That, that was a huge issue, wasn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, again, I'm a VA. I'm older than all of you put together, I think. I remember, uh, I remember Watergate watching those dark hearings on Put together. Put together. Put together. <laughs> <laughs> and Gandalf. Yeah. Put together. Um, I have 300 years old. <laughs> but, you know, he, he wrote in on this, this wave of populism that, uh, you know, I'm, for the, I'm a billionaire, but I'm for the little guy. Um, and, and again, what ought to disturb you, I think, is, is look at that health care bill that, that came through. How is that going to help the little guy? I mean, it was a huge tax cut for the rich people. And for, for old people like me, uh, who I'm not quite ready for Medicare yet, but, but it's, it's going to, you know, it, it's not going to be that long. Uh, you know, had that thing passed, I'd have been hurt. Uh, you know, in terms of, of paying for it, it, let alone, you know, some poor guy making $12,000 a year in Appalachia or something like that. So I'm a little concerned that there's a there's a disconnect between the populism that, that he was elected on, which, which obviously had a great appeal, and the policy, and, and the policy that, that, that's following that, because the, the policy that's following that doesn't seem to be as populist as the, the rhetoric. No, and I'm glad you brought up infrastructure, though. The American Society of Civil Engineers, which obviously have a stake in this, rate our infrastructure in the United States as a D plus. That is not a good grade. I know you're a student. <laughs> right? D equals to grade. D is not great. So they have a stake. So civil engineers have a reason for us to spend money on infrastructure. Granted, got it. But we also need people with expertise to build that infrastructure because Despite a bunch of degrees sitting up here, we're not building any bridges. No, okay, we can't that. do that, right? <laughs> so we need highly skilled people who can design and construct those kinds of projects. Like I said, I went to kindergarten in Flint, Michigan. And people I went to kindergarten with have grandchildren and children there now. They can't turn their taps on because of a failure of infrastructure and a failure of leadership. The infrastructure that is unseen also gets forgotten, <coughs> but a collapsing bridge really focuses the mind. I was in Minneapolis for that one. Exactly. So we've ignored these issues. They get more <coughs> expensive with every month that they are ignored. And that is another place where I think that people in who do this sort of thing should do a better job of saying how important it is that we support infrastructure projects. Well, and, you know, there's a lot of lovely stuff uh, that we could say that Donald Trump kept saying he was going to make great, um, beautiful, wonderful. It was going to be the best. We were going to have the best roads and the best everything. And we, we simply don't. I mean, you, only, you don't need to go too far to see that we don't. You don't have to drive to central Pennsylvania and turn on a water faucet and watch fire come out of it. You don't have to go to Flint and have to buy bottled water. 
You, but you know, and I don't have a PhD in anything but communication, so I sure as hell probably should not be believed when I tell you there's